So hi everyone and welcome to this research seminar for the Staff Brain Network. I will give a little overview of the Staff Brain Network and, and of Hugo's and kind of research area and then we'll go into a presentation and there'll be time for audience questions afterwards as well. Um, so the Staff Brain Network is an inclusive network for LGBT employees um, and allies and it's a resource for all staff across the university including PhD students. And we organise social and academic re related events, um, including this series of research seminars um, and a number of socials across different sites around the university, including uh, King's Buildings, the Western General and Central Campus. And there'll be some links in the chat if you'd like to follow us or join in any of um, our future events as well. So we're really, really uh, happy and excited today that um, Dr. Hugo Lazaro Ruiz is joining us. Um, so Hugo's a teaching assistant in Spanish at the University of Edinburgh, um, where he teaches on Spanish language courses. He also works as an adjunct teacher at Nebria University in Madrid, in Spain, um, where he teaches pragmatics and in intercultural competence. His teaching experience includes instructing undergraduate and graduate students from different countries and cultural backgrounds. Um, Hugo has worked at various universities and in several language schools in Madrid. And his most recent research involves, um, revolves around the inclusion of LGBTQ plus identities in Spanish as foreign language teaching. And this is a core aspect to provide students with a learning experience as inclusive as possible. So Hugo will present his research and then there'll be some time for audience questions. At the bottom of the screen is a Q&A tab and you'll be able to type your questions in as we go um, or at the end of the talk. So it's over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Da, 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 da. Okay, can you confirm that you can see the screen? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So, uh, hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here, uh, for coming today. I will firstly would like to thank to the staff right network to giving me the opportunity to be presenting here today, and especially to Rohan who organized this research seminar. Um, I will be talking about family diversity representations in foreign language course books for beginners especially in the case of Spanish as a foreign language. So I've seen some familiar faces today here, um, but the first thing is I would like to share with you is like, what is the book for us like teachers? So there are many possibilities, but I think Patricia, Lourdes, Jorge will also like think or agree with me that could be like a set of materials, can be a guide, can be the main source of ideas or knowledge, a provision of useful materials, or even a life-saving instrument for all that, all the people that teach. I think we all more, more or less share these, um, these objectives or what these ideas about what the course book is in a foreign language. Um, the reality is that it's an ideology laden cultural artifact representing almost invariably the dominant interest in society, according to what Taxel says. Um, this is because all the books that we use in class have different um, ethics, different values that we transmit not only to our students, but also to the staff. And that is called the hidden curriculum. Okay, so the objective of my research are these here. Okay, so I examine family diversity in 35 um, Spanish as a foreign language level A1 course books. And then I analyze the representation of homoparental families, identify positive aspects based on queer pedagogy, and I've provided guidance regarding inclusion of the LGBTQ plus families in textbooks. So let's go a little bit with some theoretical framework for this research. Um, the, base, the basic thing of the research was I adopted a critic pedagogy from Paulo Freire because I think it's really useful as it allows the deconstruction and fragmentation of dominant identities. 
So instead of having us against them, we can build up something together as we all, more inclusive. And that is the main idea for the queer pedagogy. Queer pedagogy offers like a lot of possibilities. Firstly, because it's uh, multidisciplinary, so we, it could be used in any discipline. It doesn't matter if it's like nature science or like biology, chemistry, mathematics, even humanities in social sciences too. And it also offers an intersectional possibility, we can say. Intersectionality was a term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, defined as the lens or prism for seeing the way in which various forms of inequality often operate together and exacerbate each other. So it's really important to get into consideration that we are all somehow oppressing and oppressed at the same time. Uh, we need to take into consideration not only sexuality or identity, but also ability, age, um, ethnicity, et cetera. So it's really important. So queer pedagogy has been developed in two different branches, we can say. The first one is what is called inclusive pedagogy, according to Cynthia Nelson. Um, this inclusive pedagogy also uh, refers to critical thinking. And basically what it does is uh, LGBTQ plus inclusion in teaching materials. So basically we put on the spot all the queer community and we get to um, visualize the it like through our teaching materials. But according to Cynthia Nelson, the problem here is how do we represent these identities? So for example, if I have um, a couple that is um, two women, basically. So what is a lesbian? How do we represent what a lesbian is? So how do we depict it without being, for example, um, using stereotypes or um, not doing it like properly? So these are some of the main problems that inclusive pedagogy has, according to this author. And that's why they've developed another branch, we can say, that is in queer in pedagogy, which also derives from critical thinking and queer theory, um, gathering some aspects like, for example, performativity. So like we perform gender in our daily lives, or uh, we read each other so we can tell like, what's the gender of this person, or uh, also the spectrum for sexuality that is very big and is fluid, so we can change our identity throughout our lives. Um, using this approach, Nelson says that it's interesting to problematize all identities. Problematize all identities would be like, not only putting on the spot like queer community, but any person also hetero, heteronormativity. Um, it, this allows teachers to become facilitators of learning rather than just experts who simply deliver information because of course we are teachers, we don't know everything, we're not robots, but we can give sources to our students and we can make questions to them that make them be more critical and um, reflect upon all these topics such as, for example, if we have like a picture of one man and one woman that seem to be close and they, you know, students could say like, okay, they're married. So we can ask them, well, why do you think they're married? They could be colleagues, they could be friends or, you know, they don't have to be like married to each other because there's an assumption of heteronormativity in teaching materials and in society in general. So these are basically the two branches of queer pedagogy. Um, I think that we don't have to see them like one against each other, but one that complements the other. I think it's important to have or use both of them. Um, according to the teaching materials in Spanish and the queer community, there has been some research from 2017. And these are the main conclusions that all these researchers uh, have. Um, so according to Rodriguez, um, no normative sexualities are underrepresented in course books, and there are a few mentions in intermediate and advanced levels. 
uh, Ramirez stands that there's a scarcity of representations of distant orientations, and uh, they found photos of homosexual couples in two course books that are really well known among Spanish teachers that are Aula 3 and Aula 4. And then according to Lambda, teaching materials do not represent the reality of the LGBTQ plus community. And when they do, it is fundamentally between two men. But fortunately, we have some positive examples in Catalan as a foreign language. And then Morales Vidal and Casani um, stand that there is an underrepresentation of LGBTQ plus identities and family diversity in textbooks as well as Engra, who says that there is a lack of representation of LGBTQ plus issues in course books and a predominance of heteronormativity family models. So yeah, we can tell that LGBTQ plus community is not very represented in textbooks. So some key concepts, especially for those of you that are not teachers or to fully understand the presentation today. Um, in Europe, when we teach a foreign language, there's the Common European Framework of Reference for the teaching languages. So basically, this standardizes the levels and, in general, the main contents that should be covered in each level. But then in the case of Spanish, uh, Cervantes Institute, who is the largest organization in the world responsible for promoting the study and the teaching of Spanish, and Spanish culture or Hispanic culture in general, um, also did the curricular plan for each of the levels. So we do have a document where we know for each level what exactly we do need to teach, such as according to vocabulary, grammar points, all social cultural values, cultural aspects, etc. cetera. Um, and well, the levels are divided into three categories. So we have A levels, level A1 and A2 is for beginners, then B1, B2 for intermediate, and C1, C2 for advanced. So what I did is I used this curricular plan as one of the main sources to do the analysis. And first of all, I had to do some research about family. Now, do we need to teach about family? And yes, indeed we do have, because as you can see in figure one, uh, in the section of social cultural knowledge and behavior, there's the family unit. So, okay, we need to teach about the family. But then I wanted to know like, mm, what sort of families? And I've, I found out that homosexual families are represented in the section of traditions and social changes. So you can see here in this red square, like uh, appearance of new fami family models, such as homosexual families. So it's a content that is covered by the, this curricular plan. So it should be in all the textbooks. And then what I did was I went through all the notions. So basically vocabulary uh, related to family relationships in all of the levels although I'm focusing on the beginner, so in level A1 and A2, and I translated this into English so you could understand better. Um, you can see like vocabulary, like family, parents, uh, children, uncle, niece, grandparents. Then we go to adoptive family, foster family, living together like a, as a couple or in the advanced ones like monogamy, consanguinity, matriarchy, so more fancy vocabulary. And um, what I did was try to um, set what are the different types of family in each level. So extended, reconstituted, nuclear. So you can see that on the bottom. And according to the types of families, because of, of course families are diverse, but there are many, 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 many types of families. And I'm not um sociologist or I'm not an anthropologist, but I I used for as a base the studies from Escardín, Quintero, and Fuentes, and I've identified several types of families that are first of one, first of all, like adoptive family. So your child is adopted, it's not yours, it's not but it's not like um biological. Then we have what we call nuclear family, which is like mom, dad, and then the kids, biological. And then we have the what is called conjugal diet, basically a childless family. So mom, dad, and 
maybe a cat and a dog, but no children. Single parents. What do we call in Spanish reconstituted family? In English, could be also known. It's also known as blended or set family. So basically, when you get divorced and you meet another person, and that you marry with that on new person, and you have a lot of family like step brothers, step sisters, or daughters, etc. So it's like reconstituted. Then we have the homoparental families with two dads or two moms. The extended family, which is the bigger one with the grandparents, uncles, cousins, etc., and a large family basically is a nuclear family, but with three or more kids. So those are the family types I've identified according to these um, sources. And well, uh, when we think about the family, I think it's something interesting and we know what we're talking about, but I propose you these. Um, imagine that an alien is traveling to the earth. How would you explain to it what a family is? And I would like you to share with us like a definition. What would you tell the alien? I cannot see you, I cannot see the chat, but you can open your microphone and share your definition. I don't think people can use their microphones, but if you do write in the chat, I can say it out. Okay, that's another option. Thank you, Rowan. Okay, we've got uh, people that care for each other. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know it, yeah. Uh-huh, very good. What else? Okay, yeah, but Natalia, like more specific, what will you tell the alien? <laughs> the alien doesn't know about Cuba. <laughs> Mom, a dad, and two kids. Oh my God. No. <laughs> well, I mean, what? Share responsibility. That's a good thing. Um, what I'm trying to bring here is um, that we all know more or less what a family is, but when we have to make like a definition, it's quite hard to really put words specifically what we need to you know a group of people who form a community or common care Ooh, interesting well i've i've chosen um this um definition from morales uh which had more sense and what's much better in spanish than in english but it's a set of individuals who organize themselves in different ways during different times and places so it's quite general because um, we need to think that um, economic and social political changes have created new meanings for this term. So it's not the same what we understood as family in 19th century that in the 21st century. So all these due to divorce, civil unions, assisted reproduction techniques, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's interesting. So basically, if we want to be recognized legally as a family in our societies, um, we have just three different ways. The first one would be through marriage, and of course, through a marriage that is um, registered, so not all sorts of ceremonies are registered or are legal. Um, then we have the filiation. You know, here's when we come about all the, you know, all the consanguinity and all the blood, you know, and all that thing of that idea and then uh, adoption so these are the three main ways to get legal recognition as a family so uh let's move on to the methodology so once we have a little bit of the theoretical framework um i will go briefly through this methodology and then if you have any questions i can um go deeper. But basically for course book analysis, I follow the methodology proposed by Ethetha. Um, I follow a systematic and descriptive and proactive approach, which basically says that I did it systematically with a lot of description and before using the teaching materials to look for the characteristics, if, there's, if it's suitable or not, and where are the pros and the cons of each uh, teaching material. I focus on the linguistic samples, but also on the pictures and text. 
And uh, the object of the research was the family models through the lexicon and the social cultural values. And objective is, are there any homoparental families here? Yes, no. How we depict it? depict them i mean you know how do we well, what sorry what is the representation like um so some quantitative analysis because my research is mainly qualitative descriptive here we have um the models for the families um yeah there's some of them are different from the ones i uh, i've introduced before due to the fact that some of the course book had a classification and I just followed that classification because it was not the same classification. So it was really difficult, but definitely this is a limitation. I should uh, explore like how to bring together like both classific classifications. But what is important for us is like 48%, so almost half of the course books um, have extended families. So the big one with the cousins, the grandparents, etc. And then the second is the nuclear family. So mom, dad, and the kids. And home parental families represent just the 3%, which is not a lot. But fortunately, um, these books offer different models. So not just one model. So they try to use the different models. And we can say that 77% are Present like diverse families, but no homoparental families, just 23% represent homoparental families. So these are, you know, I'm from, I'm not from mathematics. So basically from 35 curse books, only two had homoparental families. Uh, I say two, I, I, I said three, but it's two, three. We will see why is this two or three. Okay. So it's not very much. So let's see a little bit the description of these books that um, uh, consider the homoparental family. So the first one is Aula Plus from Diffusion. In the Activity C, page 76, we have um, different people from a family and students need to read the descriptions of each member of the family and draw the family tree. So here we have, for example, Karina and Anna. So Karina says like, uh, Karina has 49 years old. She's a doctor and she's married with a female engineer because in Spanish we have gender in um, nouns, adjectives, etc. And then we have Anna, right? Anna is 45. Uh, she's an engineer. She's married. She doesn't have any kids, but she's an, an, an aunt, okay? So Anna and Karina are married. So here we have, for example, one example of um, two women married, so a homoparental family. Inside a bigger family, so it's quite interesting because this is like reality, so it's a representation of reality, so it's quite good, so very good. Then in the other book is Genial A1 from Enclave L, who has this activity C on page 44, uh, where we have several pictures um, for fam from famous people from Spain, like celebrities, etc. And they have to match the, um, the picture with the people and the type of family. And for example, picture number two, here we have Jesus Vázquez and his husband. So Jesus Vázquez is a TV presenter, broadcaster, very famous, for example, in um, talent shows in Spain. And he's gay and he's publicly gay. So um, we have the picture in number two, and then also Ricky Martin in number four, singer um, from, from Puerto Rico and uh, with his two kids. So for example, here we have different types of family mm -hmm. and the home parent of family too. And then I think this is one of the best exercises I've ever seen regarding the inclusion of LGBTQ plus community, or in this case, homoparental families, also in Genial Uno, but in the activity book. So in this activity, basically we have uh, a picture of a building with different neighbors and a text um, about Spanish families. So basically what students need to do is, first of all, they need to complete the gap. It's a drill exercise, complete the gap with the correct uh, conjugation of the verb in the present tense. And then they need to match the numbers with the letters. So which piece of the text is referring to each family? 
And the most interesting here would be like D. So in number 10, they, they say it's like on the fourth floor, um, Pablo and Vicente, that are two, two men, uh, share house. They are a couple and they have a dog and a cat that are very beautiful. So explicitly, the book says Pablo and Vicente are a couple. So there's no queer baiting here. It's real, okay? So I think it's really interesting. And also there is a video, I don't have time to play, but I will share it on the, on the chat if you wanna see, from, um, from Costa Rica, I think it was from, uh, um, some biscuits from Costa Rica and it was a TV commercial and there are different types of family where are also like two men as a family. And then we have, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Robbie. And then uh, we have um, Metodo L, which is the third book that is, we'll see. So in the analysis, I said yes, but I have some doubts. Why? Because we have Paco and Alfredo, okay, the two guys on the picture on the right bottom. Uh, but if you compare the pic that picture with Angela and Esbeta or to Juan and Luisa, mm, you see there are some differences, right? Like Angela and Esbeta are quite close, so we can figure out that they are a couple or at least they have a close relationship. Whereas, for example, Juan and Luisa, they have like the little kid. So you, we presume that it's an adoptive family and they're, they're a couple. But what about a Paco and Alfredo? I mean, are they a couple? Are they flatmates? Are they friends? Are they colleagues? I don't know. Are they bros? Who knows? So, well, I said, okay, yeah, let's let's put it like in the, in the sample for the three books, but... I'm not quite sure. Okay, so this could be an example of queer baiting, maybe. Um, well, I would like to share some lost opportunities from these books. Um, for example, in the first picture, um, El Actual A1, we have extended family, and we have, for example, um character here that is Gloria. So Auntie Gloria could be a person from the LGBTQ plus community. So could you, we could use her um, to be a member of, the, of our community. Or for example, uh, another thing we could do in number two, which is Hablamos Español, level A, page 75, we have the family tree and they have to read the information and complete with the name of the person, but there are no clear instructions. So Victoria could be married with another woman and Luis, which is a man, could be married with another man because there are no instructions. I mean, we, there's a presupposition that we will follow like heteronormativity, heteronorm heteronormativity, but we can, for example, ask the students like, why? If we, why don't we put them like with another person? Because why, 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 why are you assuming that they are hetero? And that will lead up to a conversation and maybe as an opportunity to, um, to teach them, right? And talk about the issue. Or also in number three, we have from Embarque L, uh, five different pictures. So for example, picture number three or picture number five, they also could be part of the community, um, like trans or could be also like single mans or could be, I mean, doesn't matter. They could have any sexuality. So we could use them um, as lost opportunities to maybe raise awareness about the issue. So let's go to some conclusions. Um, firstly, books tend to use the extended family as, a, as the main example to teach the vocabulary. And this is quite logical because extended family offers the opportunity to have one picture and all the vocabulary covered. So mom, dad, brother, sister, grandmother, niece, grandson, uncle, auntie. So it's interesting. I mean, it's logical to use it. Um, to a certain extent, these course books consider family diversity. We've seen it. However, homoparental families are the least represented. Why is this? Um, there are some possibilities. For example, like I heard like um, that uh, sexuality is not meaningful when teaching a foreign language since um, 
it is an aspect that is not related to linguistics. Um, then sexual orientation is private and it's not linked to teaching a foreign language. And I say, yes, but really? Okay. So we have all these pictures where sexuality is not relevant. Um, yeah, and you can see here the grandparents and the parents, or in the one that says, tus amigos son mis amigos, we have with my boyfriend, or here down we have like the female, the male, and the kid, yeah, okay. So it seems like if it's heterosexual, is not private, okay. And then um, also um, some teachers think that some students might feel uncomfortable talking about these issues in class. But the truth is, and I totally agree with Morales and Casani, um, that a binary representation with cisgender people, heterosexual couples and families with father, mother and children does not compromise themselves because of course, books in the end are part of a company and what companies want is to make money and to sell the books. So if we put this, we won't be able to sell our book all over the world because there are so many countries that wouldn't allow their teaching materials to be this inclusive. So that's the point. And a little bit more, uh, when represented, homoparental families are equally depicted uh, in comparison with others, so are in the same level. Um, but as we've seen, not all books uh, represent, um, represent um explicitly the home friends or family so maybe is this queer baiting um then also visibility could be increased by using extended family mother as the book aula does which is reality and is quite interesting um as landa stated um there is an overrepresentation of gay men in these families and all families in the LGBTQ plus community should be included without falling into stereotypes. So I found um, that Caden Coleman, that he is a trans, um, it's not influencer, but it's trans activist from the United States. Um, he has written a book, I think it's not published yet, called Dads Give Birth To. So this also will represent like trans families. And um, I think you can, he depicted the family, his family in a more representative way, not like, for example, uh, some news, like, for example, having the picture of two men and one with a belly pregnant and, you know, these things of stereotypes and things like that. So I think this could be a good representation um, for the trans community. And the final thought is like um, teaching materials should pursue authenticity to stimulate question and enrich learners critical thinking and curiosity. So thank you so much. Hey, thank you so much, Igor. That was really, really interesting. Um, so we've got a Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. If you have any questions, if you could type them in there um, and we'll read them out so that um, everyone can, can hear what they are. I um, guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, I'm, I'm interested in like how you began researching this. Um, was it something you were noticing whilst teaching Spanish as a foreign language? Yes, first of all, because I'm part of the community, so I feel underrepresented myself in this case. And then because always it's very normative, so I say like, why is this? Is this the course book that we're using? Is it because not all course books use them? And that was the main, the main aspect of the research. And I try to do it for the beginners because I know that also for intermediate levels and advanced levels, there are some research too, but the family is taught basically in, um, in the, in, for beginners because it's when they need to talk about their more the reality and also what if we do we have students from the community or they have like two moms two dads or whatever they they had the right to express that too and to to pick their family so yeah i think that was the main the first um what what, what the main the first reason or the main reason why i conducted this research 
But yeah, I think that links back to your conclusions of why it's important to have representation of you yourself don't feel represented in in the textbooks you were using to teach. Sorry, what was that a question? Oh no, it was just a reflection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really important, and we need to get into consideration that, as I said, because I mean, it's not only representation, the representation for us as teachers, but also as for students, and also it's part of the part curricular plan from the Cervantes Institute. So it says there that it has to be there, and it's not there. So I think we need to raise awareness about it. Uh, I'll read out the question from Lloyds, mm -hmm. which says, um, do you think that we as teachers are doing enough in the decolonization process of the Spanish curriculum? That's a, <laughs> that's a good question. I think, I, I don't know because I don't, I mean, I just have the perspective of the University of Edinburgh and my previous experience in Spain, so I just can compare like these two scenarios. I don't have like a broader perspective of how is it going, but I think here in the UK, um, it's the universities or high like institutions, like educational institutions, also in primary or secondary schools, are more keen into to colonize the the curriculum. Of course, like I think like um, gender and how we construct gender is part of that needs to be decolonized because I mean we're we know that there are several societies and communicate communities all over the world that don't have like a binarist vision of gender and we as western cultures or our ancestors who went there and conquered them basically said no this you're wrong and this is what it is so i think in the case of the university of edinburgh we're doing our best and Little by little, I think, yes, we, there are some, um, we're doing things. So I think, yes, we're in the process. I mean, it's a long path, but we are in the process. Ooh, okay. Um, my students criticize this heteronormative representation in the text. Um, well, I have to be honest. And when I teach the family, for example, I we tried, we have our own PowerPoints and teaching materials. So we expose them to different families. So they, we don't get the critic because they are exposed to these, these different types of family and they just say, okay, it's fine. So it's like normal for them. So sometimes what I see is like, when we talk about these topics, um, teachers are more worried that students. So I think for students it's normal, but for us, we try to overthink like, mm, is this gonna be okay or not? Should we do this or not? It's too aggressive or it could be, you know, violent for some students or something like that. And then in the end, when you do it and you think it's really, really difficult, you find out that it's not that difficult and the students really like it and they say, yeah, like it's normal for them. Uh, well, there's a question from George uh, in the in the Q and A tab, um, and George says, "Thank you for your research, Hugo. How do you compensate this underrepresentation in your classroom, in your daily work at the University of Edinburgh? Um, also, could you tell us a bit more about the Catalan as a foreign language? Interesting example." Okay, um, so for example, what we tried to do and what we did was um, querying some of the teaching materials. So basically, we have two options, or we start from scratch and we do our own teaching materials because we don't find we didn't find anything that was suitable in the book, for example, or we try to use the source from the book, but we give a twist and we query it. So for example, why we one of the things that I really like for especially when teaching the family and the vocabulary, uh, along with the possessive pronouns, is um, instead, I haven't, there's an exercise for the vocabulary of the family saying like, for example, the mother of my mother is my grandmother. So I query that. So I put something like, the husband of my brother is my, and then you say, yes, your brother-in-law. 
So I do it like, for example, like two men or two women and integrate that into the whole activity. And that, for example, is something that is minimum, but is really interesting because it's there. And we're doing, we're not doing something like really, really, really difficult or designing something innovative, but just, just giving a touch. And that's, for example, something that works very good. Or then, for example, when we, um, we use pictures in our PowerPoints instead of going for the traditional nuclear family, white people, we can do like more intersectional um, people. So for example, people of color and it's a trans family or it's a, a two women with no kids or with two kids or whatever, and interracial families, whatever. So for example, these are some some of the examples that we do in, in, in Spanish for, for the family. And um, yeah, so we do a little bit. And then there was a follow up from George as well that says, um, what about other languages taught at the University of Edinburgh? Do you think there's the same level of awareness? I can, I don't have an answer for that because I don't have, I have to be honest, I, I haven't taught to all the section and all the languages. I mean, we have like, we offer a lot of languages, um, Japanese, Chinese, Persian, Russian, Spanish, Portuguese. I mean, I'm aware a little bit about DELC. So in case of European languages and cultures, I think we are aware of that. And especially I know examples from Italian department in using, for example, inclusive pronouns. Um, but I, and in French, I think they are trying to do something also, but apart from that, I don't have the information, so I don't really know. Sorry. Um, and then there was a little bit of a, a follow-up from Natalia about um, the question on decolonization before. Um, just pointing out how the West dictates how we learn Spanish. Um, yeah, I think, um, well, the case of Spanish is a little bit special, I think, because, yeah, due to the past, um, Spanish now is like, even it's, if it's, it has different, for example, accents, variations, but the main um, grammar points, for example, are basically the same so we can understand each other and there's not that variation. There is variation, but it's not like a huge variation that makes totally not understandable. Um, but I think in the case of decolonizing and going to a bigger issue in general, like LGBTQ plus community, not only families, for example, like the pronouns or using, um, gender neutral pronouns. Um, Latin America is leading this path, not Spain. And it's quite interesting because it's the what it used to be the colony and not the the, colon, the colonizer who is more conservative. So it's interesting how they are developing this and to see this new perspective. And that's why, for example, in our case, Dr. Carlos Soler, um, introduced a new approach, for example, in history of the language, Spanish language, rather than starting from the point of Spain and the, coloni col the colonizer, he started with um, South America or Central America, like Latin America, and then go to Spain. So it's like a change of view and perspective, which I think is quite interesting. And also I forgot about the Catalan that you they were talking about. Um, if you want to know more about the Catalan, um, Landa, this, I can give you the, the, the details for, for this study, but is basically he, uh, in, the, in the Catalan books, what they do is, for example, things like the little things like what I, the example I gave about the family with the, the brother of the, sorry, the husband of my brother, or for example, um, giving a description of, uh, a woman and she's my girlfriend or things like that so it's possible to do it and also we have some examples from English as a foreign language um, that could be applied also to other languages so I think 
we can do something. It's not that difficult. It seems to be difficult, but it's not that difficult, actually. It's apart from individual efforts of teachers, where do you think responsibility lies in trying to change um, family representations in textbooks? Um, is it up to the publishers themselves? Or do you think we could do other things? Mm, okay, so I think it's a little bit both. I mean, we are all in this together. So um, the um, publicists, as you said, like the ones who create the books also are aware of the, the how the society works in that country or in that particular scenario. So for example, I'm aware that, for example, nowadays we have more representations according to ethnicity in the books, whereas like 10 years ago, everyone was white, but now it's not. And that's, for example, is something that came from the United States. So when you teach in the United States, for example, um, racial or like racism is an issue. I mean, all over the world, but like ethnicity is something um, really important all over the world, but especially in this case, in the context of the United States. So the books weren't really reflecting that reality. So people asked the publishers to include like more diversity in these terms. And also we can find out like in general, I can say from my from what I've seen that books now are more diverse also in terms, for example, of age, because when we tend to think in a foreign language, all the pictures are like people are very happy, always um, young people, very beautiful. And in this case, it's like, um, no, I mean, we need to represent like reality and that's not everyone. So they are changing things. And I think that's also like the main problem that uh, publishers want to reach more public and more, they want to sell the books all over the world. And in the case of ethnicity, it's kind of okay for everyone, but in the case of sexuality and gender is not still maybe like that because as for example, Russia, you wouldn't be able to sell these books in Russia or you wouldn't be able to sell these books in Saudi Arabia, Arabia or some other countries that are totally against the LGBTQ plus community. And they will say like, this is propaganda or whatever. And that is also a risk publishers need to need to take or not. I mean, they decide it, but I think in the end, they will have to change because it's, it's, it's a demand. I mean, people are demanding this. I mean, teachers, students, everyone, society in general. So they will have to do this. Yeah, and change it. That probably links to, um, to a comment by Fiona who says that um, they use Duolingo and it's very good at representing LGBTQ plus community in its exercises and its characters and personalities. Um, and that's becoming a much more common way of learning a language that isn't um, straightforwardly from classes and textbooks. Yeah, totally. I mean, then, well, this is something like is interesting also and good for learning the language because you're interacting with other people and of course when you learn a language it's not only the book it's I mean I always tell my students like language is outside so you need to practice outside the classroom the classroom is just like you know an environment that is not real um we have many possibilities I mean we can use the textbook but we don't need to use just the textbook we need we can use TV shows, we can give them many more resources as the inquiry pedagogy suggests, um, giving posts from Instagram, for example, to read or videos from TikTok. So we can take advantage of these sources, especially for uh, university students with our generation Z and they are digital, 100% native, native digitals, and they are aware of this. So I think like Duolingo, um, these sort of, of apps would be great and may raise awareness, but I think we as teachers could raise awareness through other sources that are available on the internet, for example. But this will make us, we will need to reach them. So we need to invest our time in do some research or gather with other colleagues or working together to provide sources to these students so they can use them and they can follow up with this. So yeah, definitely technology and um, apps are 
are very important for this. Yeah. We've got time for a couple more quick questions, if anyone has any. In the meantime, from Robbie, is um, how is representation of disability covered at the moment? As Robbie says, is the most underrepresented group, I think, because, um, and that is an issue. They should be, that should be another research completely different according to disability in terms of intersectionality. Um, yeah, I, I don't have like data because I didn't research about it, but from what I know from the books and what I've seen, um, I think there is, underrepresentation of disabilities in this case, or um, especially because there are some invisible disabilities, and then we do have an other one, so representing them might be difficult, but I think it's not that difficult because, for example, I find out like a place where you can create your characters, um, and for example, I created one uh, in a wheelchair, like blah, I said it's she's a uh, black trans woman on a wheelchair and it's you know it's changing the narrative basically as it happens with books movies um comics you know all these cultural products we can say so yeah that's definitely in the case of spanish uh i think that should be that we need to raise awareness about awareness about so that's why i think queer pedagogy and intersectionality are a good tool to get like all these different um, factors in consideration. But yeah, it's underrepresented. So we'll, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for coming to talk about your research. I was incredibly interested and it's, it's possibly like many things, something you don't really consider until it's a, a process that you go through when you're, you're learning a language and it doesn't represent you. Um, so thank you for coming along and, and talking about your research and please do keep in contact with the Staff Pride Network. Um, and as Jonathan says, uh, it's really fantastic to, to get diverse families uh, more visible when learning a new language. Um, kind of carrying on the theme of, of linguistics, our next research seminar is on the 8th of December and Dr. Christian Ilbury um, will talk about the sociolinguistics of gay digital identity. Um, and his talk is entitled Linguistic Appropriation and the Construction of Gay Identity. And if you want to find about more about that, that's on our Eventbrite um, and hopefully Robbie will be able to paste some links to our social media and different platforms. And we've also got recordings of lots of past research seminars on YouTube for you to watch with covering a, a massive range of different topics. Um, also, if you're interested at all in presenting your own research, uh, please get in contact. That'd be really great. We'd really love to learn more about um, different researchers at the University of Edinburgh and the work that they're doing, um, really important topics. Oh, hi, Jonathan, just joining in. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and, and keep in contact. Please follow us on, on social media. Um, and we look forward to welcoming you to more research seminars in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>